Known as Faux Rock for his ferocious hitting style, David Fulcher spent eight years brightly in the spotlight of the NFL. We embrace them, cheer for them. They are heroes in our eyes. Yet when their time in the spotlight ends, many go on to do the most important work of their lives. They go into overtime. Welcome to Overtime, life after the spotlight with NFL All-Pro David Fulcher and his co-host, national award-winning speaker David Coleman, exclusively on the Bootleggers Music Group Radio. Welcome, guys, to another episode of Overtime, life after the spotlight. I am David Fulcher, my co-host David Coleman, and we've got a special guest uh, on my show, one of my former teammates, uh, Hall of Famer, Mr. Everything when it comes to football. USC Trojan. I had to put that in there. I'm an Arizona State guy, so had to throw it in there. Anthony Munoz, how you doing, my friend? Doing great. How you doing? Good to be with Thank you. you man. David, David. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you for having. Thank you for coming on, big man. Oh, my yeah. pleasure. Anthony, it's good to see you. And as we talked about before we hopped on live, uh, I'm doing a double thing here. I'm, I'm showing my co-host a little love with the fork. And I yeah. didn't have anything USC because I'm a Michigan fan. We could talk about that for a minute because last week had to be That's tortured right. for you. He but might not. He might not want to talk about that one, Dave. That one might hurt. We're talking Bengals. We're talking inspiration. Uh, <laughs> offline, if you want to talk big house, we'll talk big. There you go. There uh, you we don't go. have to talk big. Or house. If you want to just talk about my record against the Big Ten, I can do that too. So there you go. You know what? <laughs> that's we, all I control is when I play. So we know, could do that. Uh, David <laughs> usually gives me a second to let people who didn't follow your career. I'm, just, I'm not going to try and go through your accolades. That's just ridiculous. And it's the first time I've ever had to take two shots on my phone to get everybody's awards. Yeah. in. But just a couple, Anthony, 1991 man of the year in the NFL, nine time first team, all pro two time second team, all pro. And you only played 13 seasons, right? Yeah. So 11. Hey, don't tell my body only 13. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, a little bit near and dear to my heart, and I'll turn you back over to David. In 98, you were inducted into the Hall of Fame in Canton. I'm from Canton. Oh, we couldn't be you. more. Uh, I was born and raised, so we're yeah. pretty honored to have you in the Hall. And uh, just a pleasure to have you on the show. David, you're, you're go. So listen, I, I always tell people this, this show is overtime life after the spotlight. We've both been in the spotlight, um, and obviously we're doing some things uh, outside of football. But Anthony, both of us, both of us are California guys, yeah. and um, I want to ask a few questions about your California upbringing, um, because we're going to have some listeners. There's some David Fulcher, there's some Anthony Munozes out there. Yeah. What advice would you give a young man or a young lady when it comes to um, changing the culture, not just living in the culture, but you both of us grew up in Los Angeles, California, and we were dealt with some culture. Give me a little bit about your background. Well, first of all, I would say to young people, don't let your culture, your circumstances dictate uh, who you become in the future. Um, you know, if you want, you can stay stuck in where you come from or you can use where you're from as a motivator. And I, and I, you know, I look at my background and like you said, we're both from the L.A. area. I grew up, my mom raised five by herself. I uh, never knew my dad, never met my dad. My dad was in and out of prison when I was growing up as a kid. So I never met my dad. So yeah. mom, mom was mom, dad, coach, and the five of us knew first and foremost, she was the boss. <laughs> so, uh, yes. but yes. yeah, so, you know, I could look at that and say, well, here we are. You, you come from a single parent home. We didn't have very much. I mean, you know, my mom, my mom worked two, three jobs to provide for five kids. So all of a sudden statistics say that this is what you should be, or this is what should happen. And, and I just found out, uh, I'm going to do a speaking thing, uh, David, later in October, and 72%, and I didn't realize that 72% of young people that have uh, incarcerated parents, 72% of those kids become incarcerated themselves. Wow. So I'm thinking, I thank God that I'm one of the 28% that wasn't incarcerated with an incarcerated parent. So I tell people, hey, don't stay stuck, man. You know, use it as a motivator. One of the things I use it as, you know, with school and athletics that was my way out of where I was. That was my way out to hopefully provide for my mom that busted her tail to provide for five kids. Uh, and that's what I, you know, that's the inspirational message. And you, you have, you can't do it alone. You know, I, I laugh, guys. I laugh when people talk about, well, this person is self-made. And then all of a sudden the self-made person gets an accolade. 
and they go up to the podium and they have like three pages of people to thank. And yeah. I'm like, wait, I thought you said they were self-made. If you're self-made, yeah. don't you get up to the podium and say, I want to thank myself. I want to thank myself. No, you thank this person. You thank that's that so person. Great. And that's, I mean, you thank the support group that you have. And with my mom and aunts and uncles and teachers and coaches, I tell you, I'm very thankful that I had that support team uh, and I was able to do a lot of the things that I've done. You know, Anthony, David told me something before we came on. Now, I don't want to misrepresent. So if I say something wrong here, please correct me. But oh. he said that you got hurt, missed most of your senior year at USC, came back, yeah. ended up playing in the Rose Bowl. And is that the year you beat undefeated Ohio State? Yeah, uh, it wasn't missed most of the year. I missed the entire year. So freshman year in college, knee, knee surgery. Junior year in college, knee surgery. So two of the first three I had two knee surgeries, major. Then senior year, last hurrah, not most, second time we had the football first game. I went down with my third knee operation, missed the entire season, uh, had surgery, rehabilitated. And, you know, I, I entered school with guys like Charles White and Brad Buddy and, you know, guys like Ronnie Lott were there, Dennis Smith, Marcus Allen. I wanted to play in the Rose Bowl with these guys, and we had played in two already. Freshman year, Junior year, we had played in two Rose Bowl, and I guess I'll have to say it. We beat Michigan twice in the Rose Bowl. <laughs> but um, I so knew I it was coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming, Anthony. I prepared myself. I knew it was coming. <laughs> so I wanted to play in the Rose Bowl. So I rehabilitated and came back and got to start. And even though I had a chance to redshirt, uh, I didn't want. I was ready to move on. I didn't want to go to grad school. I was finishing school. So I rehabbed and I got to play the entire 1980 Rose Bowl game, which was the only Rose. Rose Bowl, the only game I played my senior year. Wow. And it's funny because after playing that game, people were like, well, it's a great way to finish your career, move on, do something else. Nobody's going to give you a chance in the NFL because of your, your knee. And I said, well, let's just do this. So from January to April, the draft, I just, my schedule was go to class and bust my tail in the weight room with my, all my buddies and to see what would happen. Because that before that senior year, they had me ranked in the top five pick after that Third knee operation, like I said, be lucky to sign as a free agent, be lucky to get drafted. I said, well, let's just see what happens. And so I busted my tail and April rolled around the draft. The Bengals had the third pick. It was the, the Lions, number one. They took Billy Sims, the New York Jets, number two. They took Johnny Lamb Jones. And the Bengals happened to take a guy that couldn't stay healthy in four years at USC. And uh, so I was very thankful that Paul Brown, Mike Brown and Pete Brown and the Brown family decided to take a chance. And I wanted to make sure that that chance they took uh, worked out. So, yeah, that was uh, the third pick of the draft after playing two series. And then I played an entire game. And like I said, I played the entire game. And uh, I think I played 26 games in four years of, of my college career. And the wow. crazy thing about it is that Rose Bowl, where I missed the entire season, had seven days, 17 days of practice, was probably the best game I played in four years of not playing the entire season. And, and I'm thankful that the Brown family saw something there and uh, made me, you know, the third pick in the draft. I'm thankful. Wow. That's, that's unbelievable, man. And we talk about, um, because I've been knowing you for a long time and there's a lot of things that you do throughout the community here in Cincinnati, as well as myself. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I can remember though, when you were in college, you had a college sweetheart that you wind up marrying <laughs> and you've been with Dee Dee for, for the longest. And, Tell me a little bit about that relationship with Dee Dee, your faith, which I know you're, you're, you're a man of God. Um, has it has it always been like that when you were in college, of uh, uh, the faith and your, your relationship with Christ? Well, first of all, uh, the relationship I thought that was going to be the most important and that, you know, I met Dee Dee when I was a sophomore in high school. That's the first time I met her. Wow. Went off to USC, came back after my freshman year, and I met her in a co-ed softball game as a sophomore in high school. Came back after my freshman year, went back to my hometown, and she was playing softball one afternoon. So I went over and scouted her out, and uh, we started talking. <laughs> so we started dating that summer after my freshman year of college, and then that was June of that summer. I asked her to marry me in December, and we got married that next spring, my sophomore year in, in college. So that, that was 46 years ago. And like I said, mm -hmm. I thought that was going to be the most important decision in my life, and actually it's the second best yeah. because – Several months after we got married, uh, I had a gentleman that was on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ. I had a couple teammates there at USC that were sharing their faith with me. And 
Uh, all of a sudden, I realized this big, you know, six foot six, 300 pound, rough and tough football player, newly married. I realized I, I couldn't do it alone, that I needed uh, Jesus. And so both Didi and I, in, uh, you know, October of 1978, shortly after we got married. So that's been 46 years also. Uh, so those two relationships have been the most important in our lives. Uh, and, and, you know, I could say that that's why I've been able to do what I've done. Uh, and I tell people, you know, I just shared the story of my senior year. And I know uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when God has a plan, no man can mess with it. And no I doubt. that is his plan to, to give me another shot. Uh, because one of the things, you guys, I did uh, two days after that last surgery, I'm sitting in the bed, my hospital bed in Cedar sinai Hospital. And I'm doing a live interview with Bryant Gumble. You know him? He was a sportscaster, Dave. You remember sure. him? BC. Yes. So we're doing a live interview. And I was two days after surgery, and we're talking about this third knee operation. He says, Anthony, when is enough enough? When are you going to give it up and try something else? And right then, I know it was God put in my heart. I said, Brian, God right now laying in this bed is still giving me the passion and the desire to give it one more shot. Just one more shot. And uh, that one more shot was to play in the Rose Bowl and play 13 years in the NFL. So uh, mm. I, I know that was a God thing. And uh, I'm thankful for that uh, prompting and uh, that uh, he's been motivating me ever since then. Anthony, I, I had no idea I was going to ask you this question. It wasn't even in my thought process. But because of that story, uh, Brian Gumbel asks you when enough is enough. If you were going to have a conversation with Tua this week, another another, another hit, oh. another concussion, a lot of people asking him, yeah. you, know, you hear it out loud, when's enough enough? Well, you know, it's an interesting question because I think when you're dealing with the a joint and when you you know your body part your knee your elbow your shoulder and you're dealing with your brain i think that's a that's a, a more serious question that you have to look at uh because you know you can hobble around with your knee and uh, get it replaced but man when you're dealing with your brain and the concussions i think you have to look at that uh a lot more seriously uh so i i would say that you know that incident that that many concussions compared to the third knee operation I think it's a it's a different thing. I think it's a, a different, uh, a whole different uh, area that you have to look at. And I, you know, I hope that he's got a lot of uh, support around him, which I believe he probably does. I've never met the young man, but just listening to interviews and having followed him from college, I would imagine he's got a pretty good support system. But that, uh, I would have to say, and you know, listen to some of the guys that played when we did, and when they finally. Uh, it was time to give it up, and you know, because of concussions, I think that's something you really got to look at long term as far as being able to communicate and think and process compared to, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, technology coming along with replacements. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think he's really got to look at this seriously. You know what else is uh, uh, important? I think, and I'm looking back at your college career when you get to the NFL. Um, not too many injuries in the NFL. Everything seemed to be. Okay, I mean, the knees held up. Uh, you, you play a very long time. Uh, I remember my rookie year when I came in here. Um, I thought I was, you know, the baddest thing since sliced bread until I had to run up against 78 coming off the corner in practice, and he brought me down to earth. Tell me how important is it for you or us as athletes to have a consistent um, relationship with each other to be better men, not just football players, because I can tell you when we played, it was like EF Hutton. When Anthony Munoz spoke, we all listened. <laughs> when Boomer Sison spoke, we all listened. Uh, when Tim Crumry spoke, we all listened. And by the way, last night's Ring yeah. of Honor was That's unbelievable, special. man. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. That, uh, that stadium was jam-packed for uh, Timmy and Corey Dillon. Yeah. But for those that are listening, man, tell me what – leadership qualities do you think that young men or young ladies that are out there leaders uh role models what what's your take on the the young men who are playing today in college football with the portal and the transfers that goes on and the thought process in that well i think first of all david you talk leadership in my humble opinion i see too many guys self-proclaiming themselves as leaders Huh. I think your teammates, I think your team, I think your whatever your company that you're, I think those are the ones that proclaim you the leader. Uh, and what I would say is uh, leadership is influence. 
Uh, you know, I learned at a young age from my older brothers playing sports. I learned at USC. Uh, my older brother, who's eight years older than I am, uh, baseball is my first love. I started playing at six years old, and I'll never forget. It was like he shared this with me yesterday. He said, Anthony, if you're good enough, you don't have to talk about it. People will talk about that. Little did I know he's teaching me humility. He said, but when you're out there, you bust your tail. So that's what I would say. You lead by example. And that's one of the things that I learned from him from college is that nobody was going to outwork me. And that was going to be my way of setting the example for all of us. Everybody's got skills. I mean, everybody's got different talents. And I think that's what a team boils down to is having influence on each other. Me not wanting to let you down, David, and vice versa. Me, you trusting that I'm going to be ready Sunday afternoon by preparation the entire week. So that is what I would share with the young men. Do whatever you need to do to get ready. And if it means Anthony Munoz, hey, Jason Buck or Ross Brown or staying after practice and taking a two, three, four extra pass sets to make you better, that's what you're going to do. David, you get, uh, you know, Chris Collins with to run a few more patterns, you know, your way so you can see it. Uh, I think that's the key. And I think that's where you build that camaraderie. That's where you build that team. Uh, and uh, I think that's the exciting thing about having played the game. People ask, you know, what's the first thing you miss about uh or, you know, you you wish you still had. And it's the time in the locker room. It's the time we yes. have on the road. Mm -hmm. Time back in the day when we had four weeks in Wilmington. You know, we were <laughs> kind of yes. helped each other up in the bed at 10, 30, 11 at night because we were so sore. That's when yeah. you build that brotherhood, man. And that's what's so great about football is that, uh, you know, and, you know, they, you know what I'm, you guys probably heard this one, iron sharpens iron, man. It's like yes. we hold yeah. each other accountable. And, uh, you know, there's guys – you know, you mentioned Boomer Esiason, and you remember the offense we ran, man. It was very – it was a simple offense, but in another in another sense, we could call one play four or five different ways. So you had to study. And the fact that Boomer, by Friday, knew what everybody did, every yes. player on offense did against every defense, every play, that was leadership, and that was holding you accountable, man, because you better be on that same page. You better study that playbook and know if Boomer calls these words – you know that it's changing the play and you're going to this. If you're sprinting down the field, he's just calling one word. We know that that's formation, play, and snap count. So um, to me, it's doing those small things and getting ready and uh, and holding each other book accountable, man. You know, there's a time, grab your buddy and say, hey, let's, let's get back in line here, man. We got to, you know, we got to, we got to go out and win this football game. And it takes all 11 on offense, defense, and special teams. So to me, that's what I've learned over the years. And, uh, uh, you just got to you got to be there for each other. Anthony, you don't realize you just did this. And I, I know David's going to agree with me. You just summarized in about a minute and a half everything that we have been trying to get across in this radio show since the moment it began. And, you know, David and I will sometimes with some of our guests will we'll talk about the fact that you'll see a team down by 38 and a personal score. They'll go in and spike it, dance. Uh, and they're, they're going and they're down 38 to seven. And. Uh, let me ask this really quickly, and I'll turn it back over to David. I, I knew you were coming on the show, and as we all see each other all the time at these different celebrity charity outings, and Anthony, you might not remember this, but the last time we saw each other, I was playing in a tournament with David. David was up on the tee. You pulled up in a cart behind me and, and stepped up and said, uh, David, do I look as bad as I'm playing? And I said, no, Anthony, you look great. Uh, but I, I asked quite a few people the last couple of weeks. We knew we were going to have you on the show. And I asked some of the, the people you played with and other pros, and I said, can I have a word, one word, one or two words about Anthony Munoz? And I just want to character, integrity, resilience, perseverance, and humility. Those yeah. are the words over and over again. And I found out today when we were vetting you a little bit before the show, the National High School Lineman of the Year Award is called the Anthony Munoz Award, correct? Uh, now, yeah, I'm assuming you're looking for more than just the best blocker out there what are you looking for when you present a high school student in this country with your award well not only that award and i appreciate those kind words i appreciate uh, the friends uh, using that and i'm thankful that uh, you know again and david knows me really well i got to reflect everything i am and who i am and what i believe in is my relationship with christ because uh you know there's times where you have a tendency to think too much of yourself and uh, you realize the gifts the opportunities that you've received or, you know, come from above. And I'm, I'm very grateful for that, but anything I do, um, 
you know, athleticism, sport is great, but I think being a well-rounded, the, the total person is what it's all about. I, with my foundation or that award, when we give awards, we want people that are not only excelling in athletics, in the classroom, community service, but they're excelling in relationships. They're excelling in who they are as people. People can trust them. People can rely on them. They can be prompt. They can be, you know, they can be prepared. They can, you know, so those are the things that we we look forward and, you know, those, hopefully those are the things that, uh, you know, I've been able to exhibit over the years and everything I do. And it's just not in athletics, but hopefully as a, as a father, as a husband, now as a grandfather, as a community person, uh, and those are the things. And I share that all the time with young people. Those are the things that are going to get you so much further than, you know, how well can you pass block or how well can you run block or, you know, how well can you, you know, defend a, as a safety, uh, the character, the integrity, who you are as a person are really going to, you know, take you a lot further. And, and that's one of the things uh, I'll never forget. My kids were nine and 11 when I was retiring. And I took each one. I took Michelle, who was nine, and Michael, 11. And I shared with them, you know, I'm getting ready to retire. I'm no longer going to play football. And Michael was, you know, as David knows, our kids were down in the locker room on Saturday, which was a light day. He was going to miss hanging out with all of his buddies, you know, all the players' kids. And my, my daughter said, Dad, will we be able to do a lot of the same things that you're doing now that we're playing? And I said, well, hopefully we will. And the great thing about uh, the, the length of time I've been retired, I've been able to do even more than when I was doing when I was playing. I think a lot of that comes from who you are as an individual, making sure that you treat people with respect. Uh, I mean, the people I've been able to meet and take pictures with, I, I still, Dee and I still pinch ourselves. I mean, you know, we've met probably you know, a half dozen presidents. Uh, I've been in Afghanistan on, you know, Blackhawks. I've been in, you know, I've been in here and there. So it's just like, man, I pinch myself. Going every August to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, the guys I've been around for the last 26 years, it's like, wait, I thought this place was only for like Otto Graham and Jim Brown and Gail Sayers and Deacon Jones, Merlin Olson, and I'm here sitting with these guys as part of it. So, yeah, it, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I really stress when we do things with our foundation and hanging out with guys like David and other teammates that, you know, uh, we're doing the same thing in the community, and that's that's what it's all about. Not only were we able to hold each other accountable on the field, but now, you know, as we get back in this great community, and like you said, we're both from the, the Southern California area. We have quite a few guys, not only from Southern California, but, but the LA area. I mean, you're talking oh, Eric yeah. Thomas and Solomon and uh, Joe Kelly and David and Anthony. Then you go a little further north with Jim Breach. And I mean, so we got... You know, I don't know what it is. Is it a pack two now, David? <laughs> but we have well, a lot they of pack eight. up people hey, lately. I well, hear that. I, I hear there's a, bunch of teams. a pack eight. <laughs> it was a pack well, eight. I hear there's a few. There's a few teams that are talking yeah. about joining because I just saw yeah. Utah State and okay. another yeah. school talking about getting in the pack. But here, I got a question for you, man. Because now you've got the Munoz brand. Yeah. You got the Munoz Foundation. You got a lot of stuff that you always do, and you've always been doing them for years. Yeah. How did you ever get involved with starting the Munoz brand and the foundation as well? Well, you know, it's interesting. And, and uh, as you know, I, I played 13 years and tried another year in Tampa. So when I finally retired, I was 35 years old. Now, you look at college students get out at 21. They had 14 years on us or how many, however many years we played in the NFL a really business. So I tried to do things during my playing career to kind of get me ready, even though Things, you know, things continue to work out in the NFL. Um, so I had a buddy who we started doing some athletic stuff. And I, you know, as we all do, I mean, you can see David's got some nice swag there. We like the swag and uh, <laughs> got involved in high school athletics. And then we uh, transitioned from uh, Munoz Brands Athletics to, to corporate. So we bring corporate wares, promotional items, and that still keeps me involved in, in the swag. So that's been going on. Got some great people uh, running that. Foundation is something that I always wanted to do, uh, but and and I understand when you're playing guys that start foundations, the the relevance, the leverage. But as a husband, a father, and a pro football player, I didn't have enough time to get involved in a foundation. When I do something, I want to be totally in. Yeah. So until eight years after I retired, I had a plan. I'd been establishing a plan. You know, when the kids were in high school, when they were in college, when they were about juniors in college, I started the Anthony Munoz Foundation. I had my mission statement. I'd already contacted a lot of business people. I had this one CEO friend who kept saying, let's do something. Let's do something. So in 2002, I said, Jack, 
we can do something now. So started out with, you know, he's, his company is no longer there. His company has been a partner for 23 years now. So it was something that I wanted to do. I wanted to give young people an opportunity the same way we got an opportunity, David. You know, you got young people that have a lot of talent, but sometimes they might need some encouragement. You know, they might need a hug. They might need some money for school. They might need, they're in school, they might need a computer because they can't mm -hmm. afford to buy a computer. Um, so we just, you know, we have all these kids on scholarship. We just had, and David, you saw the bikes, the e-bikes. We just yes. had an e-bike donated for one of our college students that wow. needed it to get around. At get the, around campus, yes. So, okay. so that's, you know, that's what I'm, why I'm doing it because it gives me a chance to, you know, I tell people, I used for 13 years, I was a member of the Bengals, a much smaller team. Now I'm a member of a big, big team, and that's the greater Cincinnati team. And, you know, David and I are still teammates because we support each other. We support other guys. And the thing I say, people say, why would you stay in Cincinnati? And the first thing I say is because of the people. It's the yes. people that right. care, the people that are engaged, mm -hmm. the people that give. And that's why I love being out uh, on this big team and hopefully impacting some young people. You know, yes. David, we just had Marty Brenneman and Lance McAllister in the last couple of weeks, Anthony, they said the exact same exact thing. Same thing. They, because of the people. And let me switch gears just for a second. And David, I'll turn it back over and right. uh, bring us toward the close. Probably yeah. Anthony, when I first moved to Cincinnati, I went to Bowling Green and came down and worked at Xavier for a while and moved down here, got married, had kids. We used to go to a restaurant called pizza tower. It was over in Loveland, right by where we lived. And if I, I, I don't want to throw, again, if I'm wrong, correct me right now on the air, but I've, I heard a rumor that that was your place. Yeah. Uh, and either at some point in time, you decided I don't want to be in this business anymore or, or it, or it failed or whatever it might be. But we, you know, a couple of the words were resilience and perseverance. And you, you tried something outside of football and yeah. it didn't, didn't work. That's a lesson for people. Well, the, the, the reason I, I tell people we got out, of, I didn't have enough aspirin for all the headaches that the food <laughs> But it was a great run. I mean, it was, I uh, had three other partners, close friends. Uh, you know, it was, um, it was wonderful. And it did well. We actually ended up originally selling the restaurant to a former uh, server and his family. And we leased the property. And then after they ran the restaurant, then we sold the property. And that's where all the money was. But yeah, it was one of those things where I wanted to try something different. In fact, uh, You'll love this. Uh, you know, back in the day, we had a, a Thursday night game against Cleveland. I, it was a few years before David got here. It was like my third or fourth year. We played Sunday, and then we played Thursday. So we had the entire weekend off before the following week. So I said, you know, and, and it was one of these restaurants, if you remember, the stairs went up four levels. So, man, the servers, they busted their tail. So and one the Saturday, thing was, it was at an angle. It was the well, yeah, it tower, looked like tower, the tower, leading Pisa, tower of Pisa. Tower. That's right. That's the whole <laughs> concept that we got it from. So one Saturday, I, I took a, a book and I said, "I'm going to work this a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to take some orders and stuff." And I tell you what, I got an appreciation for our servers and the work. Even though I was right in the middle of my season, I was in great shape. But I took like three or four orders and uh, got me a couple tips. I guess I did pretty well <laughs> fulfilling the orders. But one of the families called one of my partners over and said, uh, "I see Anthony's working here." I said, uh, "Things not going very well for him with the Bengals. He's got to <laughs> earn a little more cash here." <laughs> <laughs> I said they said no nah, he's just uh you know he just wanted to help out and stuff but it was fun yeah we had that for quite a few years we sold it and uh but like I said uh unless you're there every single day uh I mean it was it was very I mean we did really well but like I you know I, I kid about it but it was pretty serious I didn't I couldn't keep enough aspirin in the the medicine cabinet for all the headaches it brought <laughs> So I have a uh, I have a question, man, and and this is probably going to be cutting it short here. But there's a there's a parent out there that has a 15 year old, 14 year old boy mm -hmm. who wants to play football, and he's six foot four, 290 pounds. Uh -huh. uh, everybody looks at him uh, not because he's an athlete; they look at him because he's bigger than everybody else. Uh -huh. What advice would you give that young man based off of his size and his age? on achieving and wanting to be uh, an Anthony Munoz or an athlete in the NFL? First of all, I'd say you got to enjoy the sport. You got to love it. And you played it. I mean, it's tough enough. You got to have fun. Um, I tell parents, let the kids choose. And if they yes. choose not to, don't, you know, don't live your life through your kids, man. Your, your, your eligibility is all up. Mine's all yeah. up. 
Don't, yes. Let them, let them choose. But if they choose to play it, encourage them, support them, love, love them through it. Um, you know, don't pressure them, man. It, it's, it's tough. Life's tough enough. I can't imagine going through what young people are going through today. Yes. And so it, I would just encourage them. But if you're going to do it, that you give it a hundred percent. That yeah. you do everything you need to do in order to stay in there and get ready. Uh, but I would say parents support them. Um, yeah. And it, I, it's funny. I, I, and this might be a little younger than high school, but I always take pictures of different things. And I, I have, I have all these in my phone, but I took this, it's a sign up at a baseball field. And it says, please remember, these are kids. This is a game coaches. And this is a lower level coaches are volunteers. Umpires are human. Your ch your child is not being scouted by the Brewers today. You know you can take wow. that. You're kind, of, you're kind of you know adjusted to. But let them let them let them be kids. Let them have fun. But once you get to high school, I think that's where you really. I think that's where it kind of starts to separate. Uh, because you know how hard can you hit prior to high school? It's in high school, and these kids are getting much bigger and stronger and faster. But I would say let them enjoy it and let them make the choice. I mean. You know, it's um, especially if you're that big. I mean, it, you know, people expect you to play, but it's huh. you know, take it upon yourself to do what you want to do. If you I mean, if you're six four two seventy and you want to play the tuba and be the best tuba player in the marching be band, the best you can be. Yeah, yes, man, and I've seen that happen. Uh, or if your school's not that big at halftime in your uniform, play the tuba in the marching band, then go back out for <laughs> the second half. But uh, I would just say let your yes, let your young people enjoy it and uh, hmm. and don't pressure them and don't live your life through them and uh, parents uh, and I'm in the stage Dave you know I'm in the stage of watching all my grandkids play what I would say to parents is chill out man take a chill pill and like part of that I just read those umpires don't get official don't get very much to officiate umpire your kids right. game. so you know they're out there but uh, just let them enjoy it and uh, you know they got plenty of time to be serious later in life Anthony, I want to make an offer to you, and then I'm going to turn it over to David to bring the show to a close. We told you we wouldn't keep you all day, but uh, I made the same offer to Lance McAllister. I'm going to make it to, to you. I think you're sitting. Have you done a TED Talk yet, Anthony? I have, yep. Okay. Yep. What was that one called? Um, uh, moving forward with what you have and giving it your best. That's really great. What you have talked about on this program today about leadership, and if you live the life and do the job, you don't have to be your own biggest press clipping. Right. That is a that's a lesson that's missing. And I want to say the last couple of generations of young people that are coming through. So if you have thought about a plan B one, another one, uh, that is a talk that needs to be heard in every school, every high school. Uh, you have most I can't I've never taken more notes during an interview than I did during this one. Well, that doesn't back. surprise me. And last thing I will say before I turn it back to David, is <clears throat> we've had other guests and I hear because of Dave and because of the program, I meet a lot of people you used to play with, athletes from other sports, people you used to play against. And uh, you'll hear little things. They'll say, oh, yeah, but this person, this. And, oh, but do you know they're like this? That's never happened. I've mm -hmm. never heard someone come back with a secondary or under comment when your name is involved. And after, again, this 30 minutes with you, I completely understand why. And David used to say it all the time. He has reverence for everyone he's ever played with. But with you, there's another level. Well, appreciate that, guys, very well, much. It means a lot. Thank you. And see, I, I I look back and I I remember when I came in here uh, with the Bengals as a rookie. Um, I remember the very first practice, and Bobby Kemp was the starting safety. Bobby and Kemp. Bobby, you know, Bobby's 180 pounds, but he hit like he's about 290. <laughs> exactly. He would knock himself out. So yeah. LeBeau was like, "We need a safety that could to take care of. You know, if Bobby can't make it." You know, we got this guy, David, but he doesn't look like a safety. But yeah, he could play it. And, uh, he liked him playing safety for. I know. I remember that first. I remember that first practice that we had at Spinney, and uh, they call out the ones on defense, and I ran out there. Huh. And, and now we got twelve in the huddle, and Bobby Kemp looked at me like, "Rookie, what are you doing?" I hey. said, I'm, "I'm ready to play. I'm ready to play. I'm ready to get this thing going." And he said, "No, no, not now." Three days later, when they start calling out the, the ones, LeBeau said, 33, get out there. And then from there, I said, I belong here. I belong here, not just on this football team, but I'm going to make an impact. Well, and after my career was over, Anthony and I, as we still do it now, you know, where are they now? Well, 
we are still making an impact in Cincinnati and and Anthony, not not just in Cincinnati, across the country. Uh, definitely back home in California, still got some things going on there. I've got some stuff going back in Arizona, uh, yeah. back at Arizona State. So we give, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, keep doing what you're doing, man. I think uh, you've been you've been like an idol. You know, the big brother that I get to look at and say, even though you went to USC, I still consider you a big brother. <laughs> But it's all Pushing good, man. Colors. Pushing up colors. No, it's all good. All the colors look good. We both got the same colors. All look good. And right but, back uh, at you, man. I am, you know, the great thing that I enjoy is all all of you guys that we played together and that we're still here. Uh, you know, it's not like months and months go by and we don't see each other. I love that we see each other on a regular basis. And uh, there's a lot of guys. And uh, so that, that makes it fun. I mean, it makes it fun for me. And, uh, you know, it uh, – we can talk about good old times growing up in uh, down in the uh, East LA, a little east, further east, South Central. Yes. Now we're here in the Natty. So uh, yes. Good night. Thank you, brother. We appreciate you, man. All right. God bless you guys. And thank great you. show, man. Great show. Thank you very much, man. Tell Didi for uh, thank you for letting us hang out with it for a little bit, oh, and well. uh, we're gonna do it again someday. All right, man. Sounds great. I'll the Natty's there. lucky to have you. And on behalf of David Fulcher and Anthony Munoz, the Hall of Famer, the great one. I'm David Coleman, the co-host of Overtime Life After the Spotlight. Please take a moment and visit the Bootleggers Music Group app and download it. Please go to the site. Please share this interview and others with your friends. And we're sure happy to have been with you today. See you next time. You've been listening to Overtime with NFL All-Pro David Fulcher and co-host award-winning speaker David Coleman on the Bootleggers Music Group Radio. Be sure to catch all our shows and music by downloading our app at bootleggersmusicgroup.com. All content is published and owned by the Bootleggers Music Group, LLC, and Zasco Publishing, and may not be duplicated without prior written consent. Executive Producer, Paul E. Jones.